planning on giving an update on COVID-19 and what it means for us within GLG, how we are approaching it, um, and then I want to get some expert advice. Because um, COVID-19 is one of those areas where there are uh, some facts, actually a lot of facts, and even more misinformation and misinterpretation um, of those facts. Um, the kind of area where, uh, or the kind of situation where it can be hard to act with the confidence that comes from true clarity. Um, the kind of situation, sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, so the kind of situation that our business was built for. This is what we do. We bring clarity uh, to tricky, uh, like uncertain situations and we bring facts to our clients to help inform their decisions and their decision making. Stephen Ostroff, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you may recognize his name from the multitude of teleconferences that he has done for our clients globally. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to dial into any of those, by way of introduction, uh, Dr. Ostroff was the Deputy Director of the CDC's National Center for Infectious Diseases, and most recently worked at the FDA for five years, twice serving as Acting Commissioner. So again, thank you so much for being here. And I know we have a ton of questions and very limited time, so we're gonna jump right in. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ostroff, uh, can you share a little bit about your experience tackling outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics throughout your career? Sure, I can give you the short version because I'm sure you're much more interested in talking about the virus than, than hearing about me. Um, I, uh, so very important to hear what he's seen. Yeah, so, so I, as, as was mentioned, I worked at the CDC for um, about 20 years, uh, starting in the 1980s, and I worked there through the mid-2000s. And most of the time that I was at CDC, my role as the deputy director in the Infectious Disease Center, and usually when, I, when, when people ask what did that center do, I say that that's the part of CDC that does everything from anthrax to Zika. And so virtually anything that you've heard about over the years was dealt with by my part of the agency. And my role was to manage complicated disease outbreaks like this one um, and help make sure that everything was going in the right direction. And in addition to that, I did a lot of the media that some of what you hear people there doing now, um, as well as a lot of the other types of communications with Congress and with folks like that. And so that was my role. And you know, over the years, had lots of experience with hantavirus and Ebola and SARS and anthrax and bird flu and pandemic flu and the whole range of things um, over that time period. I then left CDC and went to work at the health department in Pennsylvania at the state health department doing a very similar thing for a number of years, was there during pandemic flu in 2009. And, and then sort of as a late career move, I, I got asked by the person who at the time was the was the uh, commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, who previously had been the health commissioner here in New York City, Dr. Margaret Hamburg, um, to come to work at FDA, which sort of gave me a totally different view of things. But one of the advantages of having been at FDA for about six years um, is that I also understand all of the issues that have surfaced with this virus around the development of the drugs and the development of the vaccines and the development of the diagnostic tests. And so I have one of those unique views that I can see things through the lens of both of those agencies. So really tremendous experience, really relevant here in this situation. Uh, Dr. Ostroff, can you help us understand what we're seeing in the news? What, what's the difference between the influenzas and coronaviruses? Well, besides the fact that they're totally different viruses, although they're both, both viruses, um, we have this phenomenon which has been around for many, many years, this concept of emerging diseases. Emerging diseases are things that we previously didn't recognize were out there or things that actually haven't been out there previously that all of a sudden start causing human disease. And um, this is another example of that with this novel coronavirus, what's now the disease is called COVID-19. It's another example of a new emerging disease that by all accounts, and there has been a lot of work that's now been done uh, in laboratories looking at this virus, by all accounts, uh, last October, uh, this 
virus um, didn't appear to have existed. Um, and so something happened in nature um, that made certain changes to the virus, which then allowed it to start causing infections in humans. With influenza, influenza has been around causing human disease. Um, certainly, I look like, you know, just looking around the room, I look like I'm the oldest person in the room. Um, but certainly, as long as any of us have been around, uh, the flu has been around, and so we have a certain familiarity with the flu, and it doesn't quite concern us, except every once in a while, where one of these new pandemic strains comes around, and then it becomes a big news story as well. But one of the differences, I mean, the, you know, in some ways, they cause a similar disease, and so if somebody was walking down the street that was coughing and sneezing, um, there's no way that you would be able to look at that person and say that one has coronavirus and this one has the flu. It just doesn't work that way. You have to have some sort of a diagnostic test to be able to distinguish between them. But because the flu has been around forever, um, many of the people, in fact, I would anticipate everyone sitting in this room has some level of immunity against influenza because everyone has gotten the flu several times over your lifespan, and hopefully many of you in the room got a flu vaccine, and that flu vaccine also um, develops immunity. And so if you take everybody that's walking down 42nd Street, virtually all of them will have some levels of immunity against the flu, even the strain that's you know, causing most of the disease this year. But nobody walking down that street has immunity against this new virus because it is a new virus. And because of that, it gives the virus opportunities to spread in a way that influenza can't spread because chances are that if you've gotten the vaccine, you have some level of protection, even if you're sitting next to somebody with the flu. But that's not the case with this virus. And so um, when it's this new in human populations, it gives it opportunities to spread um, from one person to another in the way that the flu actually doesn't have, despite the fact that every flu season, lots and lots of people get the flu, and it's just sort of something in the background and we get used to, except in unusual situations where you have a really bad flu year, and then there's a lot of stories around the, the, uh, the flu. The other thing to know is that over the last 20 years, there have been a series of very unusual flu strains that have appeared. Many of you have heard of bird flu. Um, virtually everybody sort of remembers those types of episodes. Um, those are very unusual viruses, and, and it's, they, they, they live in other types of animals, especially in poultry. Um, but the thing about those viruses is that they tend to cause very, very severe disease. In fact, the one that many of us have heard about, H5, um, which showed up in the early 2000s, the, the mortality rate associated with that disease is very, very high. But the thing is that it's not very easily transmitted to people. And so there's been very, 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 very few cases of any of those, and most of us don't even think about those things anymore. Um, the difference with this one is that this one looks like it, it has very rapidly become easily adapted to people, and so it's fairly easy for it to spread from one person to the next. So you, you sort of touched a little bit about the sp uh, on the spread and how mm -hmm. it spreads. Can we talk a little bit more about that? You know, we're hearing, don't wear masks, wash right. your hands, don't touch your face. You know, can you talk to us about how this COVID-19 yeah. coronavirus is spreading. So, you know, it's a new virus and, and, you know, you always have to keep that in mind. And so one of the things that I usually say is that there are some things that we know and there are some things that we don't know. There's things that we don't know we will eventually learn over time as the more experience is gained with this virus. But it does not look like this virus is peculiar in terms of the way that it's transmitted. It is a respiratory virus, just like all other respiratory virus, and it looks like it has much of the same dynamics of many respiratory viruses in that the primary way that it gets transmitted is when you cough and sneeze. And the virus seems to live in the respiratory tract, unusually, 
Um, but similar to some of the other coronaviruses that have caused problems over the years, it lives primarily in the lower respiratory tract. And so this virus does have more of a proclivity to cause pneumonia in people who acquire it, even in people who may be relatively mildly ill. If you take a, an x-ray or you do a CAT scan of those individuals, you can find some hint that maybe there's a little bit of a pneumonia there, even though most of the disease is mild. Um, but um, you know, coughs and sneezes is how the virus finds somebody else, and it finds it through what we refer to as droplets. When you cough, you cough out droplets. When you sneeze, you sneeze out droplets. And in order for those droplets to infect someone else, you have to be in very close proximity to that person. And so when you're talking about somebody in this building on another floor at the other end that uses different elevator banks, um, this is not a virus that sort of floats through the air and would go all over the building um, in, in different ways. It, you, you'd have to literally have been in close contact with an individual who's ill for some period of time. And so it's not the type of thing that if you spent, you know, 10 seconds on the elevator with somebody else, that that represents the type of close contact that's really going to be high risk. If you were standing behind somebody you know, in the line at Starbucks, that's generally not the type of close contact that we're talking about. We're talking about more sort of extended close contact with somebody who clearly is coughing and sneezing. And that's how the virus tends to spread from one person to another. There can be some unusual circumstances where the virus may be aerosolized. That's been a characteristic of other coronaviruses, but the type of situation where that happens is usually in healthcare facilities when you have someone who's severely ill that has a lot of secretions in their respiratory tract and they have to put the suction tube down there or do something that may create a lot of uh, aerosols. That's why you see all the healthcare workers taking these special types of precautions because they have to take care of those patients. Um, you hear about sort of other potential ways that this could spread. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about surfaces and whether or not you can touch a surface and pick up the virus and get infected. Um, these viruses can survive on surfaces. There have been studies in ideal conditions that show that they can survive, but they don't really survive for long periods of time. And so if you hear these stories about, you know, somebody did a study in some laboratory and nine days later they could fill, still find some evidence of the virus on a surface, you may find some evidence of the virus on a surface, but that virus is unlikely to be alive um, and capable of infecting you because even if the virus is killed and over time, uh, you know, gets destroyed, you still may find some of the genetic ev evidence that the virus was actually sitting there at some point in the past, but that's not going to cause an infection. And so in general, for many of these respiratory viruses, if you sort of cough and sneeze onto this surface, it may be there for a little bit of a period of time, but it dries out. And once it dries out, it tends to sort of die off. And even if there was some virus there, the amount of virus that would still be sitting there is so low that the likelihood that you could get an infection as a result of that is really, really very remote. That's why, you know, we say it makes sense that, you know, if you have somebody who's sick, whether it's this virus or any other virus, you know, and they cough onto a surface, it's a nice idea to sort of clean it off and get rid of, you know, those secretions so that you even further reduce your risk. And the only real sort of inanimate objects that you really get concerned about are ones that, you know, are, are, are high use. So the type of thing, you know, if you have lots of people that are touching a doorknob, it's a nice idea to, you know, clean off the doorknob or if everybody is sort of pushing the door open to go into the restroom, that's the type of thing that you, 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 you get, you know, you have to sort of, you know, clean every now and then. But, you know, this, this idea that you see in many areas where you see these, these hordes of people going down the street disinfecting everything, that makes people feel good but it doesn't do anything <laughs> uh, to, to, to reduce people's risk of getting infected. So. What about masks? 
So masks are an interesting phenomenon, and masks come up over and over and over again. Um, first of all, um, you know, if you watch anybody that's wearing a mask, there's always air that sort of flows around the side of the mask. Um, that's just the nature of those things. And um, during SARS and in several other outbreaks over the years, there have been a number of studies trying to assess the question of how effective the use of masks are. Um, and there is very, very little science behind suggesting that you, as a person who's not ill, um, that there is any significant benefit from walking around wearing a mask. The amount of data that's available to suggest that that's protective for people who aren't ill is really, really very minimal. Um, and so, you know, given that, it may make people feel good, but it's unlikely that it is protecting you to any significant degree from getting infected. The benefit of a mask is in somebody who's sick. And so if you have an individual that's sick, um, and most of these viruses are primarily droplet spread, uh, the mask actually captures a lot of those droplets and so will minimize the, the likelihood that that person would be infectious to somebody else. So there may be some benefit to masks for people who are sick, but for people who are well, uh, there's not a lot of suggestion that it's doing anything beneficial for you. What is beneficial is washing your hands and doing what we refer to as respiratory etiquette. So, you know, covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze or using a tissue or cleaning off surfaces if you know that you coughed onto a surface. Doing those things is actually, you know, there are data to suggest that that, that is protective. And, and the other thing is, um, you know, if you see somebody, you know, close to you that's coughing or sneezing, you know, keep your distance. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We've seen already, you know, a lot of a lot of steps that GLG has taken, yep. especially even signs in the in the restrooms and, and things like that. So so some experts suggest that like other coronaviruses in the warm weathers and with summer coming up, that we'll see a decrease in the spread of the virus. Uh, you know, do you think that that's true? And do, should we expect sort of another wave come fall? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. And obviously, it's a question I've heard before. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the short answer is we don't know, but, and, and, and I think that the but is important, this, this is not a magical virus. Um, this is not, you know, an Ebola virus that's so incredibly different than any other virus that we know about. <clears throat> this is a respiratory virus. Um, there are, uh, you know, lots of other, well, I shouldn't say lots of other, there, were, there are a series of other coronaviruses that cause disease in humans, um, they tend to fall into two different camps. There is one camp of coronaviruses that cause a common cold. They have been around forever. Um, they cause common colds every single year. And then there are the other two coronaviruses that you've probably heard about, given all the attention that's being paid to this one. And those other two coronaviruses, one is the SARS virus. And the SARS virus is closest to this particular virus when you look at its genetic makeup. Um, and then there's uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, um, which is a virus that was first identified back in 2012 in the Arabian Peninsula. So what's the experience with SARS? SARS was a very interesting virus in that even though it was similar to this one, it turned out to have some characteristics that were vastly different in that it doesn't appear that the SARS virus caused a spectrum of illness. And most people who got SARS back in 2003 got very severe disease and either died from that disease or they recovered. Um, and there wasn't a lot of people that got milder forms of SARS. And because of some of those features, if you think about it, if you're really, really sick, you're not on the subway. If you're really, really sick, you're not on an airplane. If you're really, really sick, you're not driving around in your car. You're either at home or you're in a hospital. 
And it turned out that it wasn't very transmissible to other people. And so some fairly simple public health measures managed to put SARS back in the bottle. And when SARS got put back in the bottle, it never basically showed up again. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome showed up in 2012, and it has been in continuous circulation ever since 2012. And so there have been cases of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome which behaves very similarly to SARS, surprisingly, in that it causes very severe disease but isn't very transmissible. It has caused disease continuously since 2012, but it doesn't transmit to humans very easily. It turns out, and you'll hear a lot related to this um, new coronavirus, where did it come from? Um, and all of these severe viruses look like they live in bats, but it's not the bats that directly transmitted it to humans. There is what we refer to as an intermediate host. In the case of SARS, the intermediate host was palm civets, of all things, which are not animals I knew very much about. Um, but they were being sold in markets in China, and that's, that's how people initially got exposed. Um, with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, it turns out to be camels interestingly enough, and, um, and that's why virtually all of the disease has been on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but you have to really come in pretty close contact with a camel to get <laughs> Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or somebody who has recently been around a camel. We don't have many of those in New York. Yeah, and we don't have many of those in New York. So, um, so that's why it's pretty much stayed in the Arabian Peninsula. But the, thing, the reason that I was saying that is that with the other coronaviruses, the ones that cause mild colds, and with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, even though it doesn't cause very much human disease, they're all seasonal. And every dog on one of them is seasonal. The flu is seasonal. All of these respiratory viruses are seasonal. And, um, and that is because they prefer cooler, drier conditions because in cooler, drier conditions, when you cough and sneeze them out, they can sustain themselves a little bit more in those droplet particles than they can in warm, humid conditions. And, um, and, and in addition to that, we as humans don't do the same things in summer that we do in winter. We spend more time outdoors. Um, you know, the, the sun is a lot stronger, and, and, and what you've heard is true. Sunshine is a wonderful disinfectant. UV light. Um, UV, UV light, light. Uh, does kill viruses. And so there are, there are reasons, as far as the virus is concerned, and reasons that things that we do that make a lot of these viruses less likely to circulate um, in the warmer times of the year. And if I was to bet, I would say there's nothing so unique about this new coronavirus that it won't do the same thing. But, and, and it is an important but, um, when viruses first show up in human populations in the way that this one has, because nobody has preexistent immunity against this virus, um, at least early on, it, it's kind of finding its way in human populations. And it's kind of, eventually it will reach some sort of equilibrium and it'll behave like most other viruses do. But early on, it doesn't necessarily have to do that. And so even in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic, it showed up at some unusual times of the year. But the thing to know about the 2009 pandemic, the same strain of flu that's causing disease this year is a direct descendant of that one. And so once that one got established, um, eventually it reached its equilibrium too and behaved like all other flu viruses. So, so I've got a couple of rapid fire questions for you, Dr. Yeah. Ostroff. Um, what is your personal travel policy? So, Interna um, are, are you traveling internationally? Are you traveling domestically? How did you feel about coming to the New York office today? Like yeah, I, 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 again, I'm in the higher risk group for complications of this coronavirus. I didn't have any problems coming here. I don't have any problems walking down the street in New York. I have travel plans to go to California next week, and I'm still keeping those travel plans. I watch very carefully what the data look like and are telling me and, and you know, given my years of experience, I know how to interpret a lot of the data and I make decisions based on what I see. I am somewhat reticent at this point to travel internationally. And, and I say that because the situation is evolving very, very rapidly internationally. And even if there isn't necessarily a high risk right now in an individual location, 
that could change very rapidly. And the one thing that I don't want to happen to me, I don't want to travel internationally and have somebody tell me you have to quarantine yourself for 14 days. Or I don't want to come back from an international trip and somebody tell me I have to sit in my house for 14 days because they want to make sure that I wasn't exposed to something. And because I don't want that type of disruption, I've decided that at least for the time being, I'm not traveling internationally. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Okay. And, and give us a quick kind of comparison. How does this, in terms of its impact, um, a kind of total impact, how do we compare that with something like the flu or something like no. SARS, which you've, you mentioned as well? How would you position it relative to those? So there are a couple uh, of things to consider. I Usually when I'm asked that question, I say this to me appears to be flu on steroids um, in that this looks like it is a somewhat more severe version of flu especially if you look at some of the age groups or some of the demographics of who develops severe disease, because with influenza, it's mostly a problem in the elderly. 90 to 95% of all of the deaths associated with the flu occur in people over the age of 65. Um, in terms of the disease itself, we tend to look at two things. One of them is transmissibility, how easy is it to spread from one person to another, and the other is how severe the disease is. And in general, for most diseases, there is an inverse relationship to how severe a disease is and how easy is it to spread. And part of it is the phenomenon that we talked about. If you've really got severe disease, you're not moving around a lot. And so that limits transmissibility. But viruses that tend to cause severe disease in humans are not well adapted to humans. And so because they're not well adapted to humans, they don't spread from one person to another. And so you have you know, many severe diseases, like I was talking about with these bird flus, that cause severe illness but are not highly transmissible. Ebola virus is not highly transmissible. A lot of diseases that you hear about with very high mortality are not easily, easily transmissible. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have diseases, you have viruses that are very easy to spread from one person to another. Um, but those viruses tend not to cause a lot of severe illness. And so even if you look at the flu, mm -hmm. the flu um, in any season has a mortality rate of 0.1%. But you hear all of these huge numbers related to flu about deaths, but that's because so many people get the infection that even if it's a 0.1% mortality, there's a lot of people who end up getting severely ill and die as a result of getting the flu. This one looks like it's somewhere in the middle between those two extremes, but it's most, most, much closer to the flu end of the spectrum than it is to many of these severe diseases. And so we don't know for certain um, what the true mortality is associated with this virus because right now virtually all of the data that are available are out of China. So, so let me, actually the first question we got from Jim, thanks for the question Jim, is, um, is about that. The number of official cases in the US, I, 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 we're officially out of time, I'm gonna keep going, I think this is sufficient, yeah, I'm getting knocked around there, people long. wanna go. Let's, we'll, no, it's perfect, thank you, and, and I'm gonna keep going for another five or 10 minutes to try and get through some of these questions. Um, the, 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 official, uh, the number of official cases in the US is 159 with 11 deaths. Jim has calculated that that's a mortality rate of 6.9%. Um, the global mortality rate is less than half an of that. Epidemiologist. Why is an epidemiologist? Yes. <laughs> Why are we seeing this disparity? So it, it, you know, in the United States right now, most of the severe illness that you've heard about and most of the infections that you've heard about have been associated with a long-term care facility in uh, Washington State. And um, if you look at the experience so far in Italy. Um, which has had a large number of cases now, has had a couple of thousand cases in Italy, um, the average age of an individual who has died in Italy is 80 years old. And so if you get this virus into the wrong setting, it should not surprise you that you see high mortality associated with people in a long-term care facility because they're in that facility because number one, they're very old, number two, they have a lot of underlying health conditions that predispose them to developing severe illness. Um, all takers, the, um, the overall mortality rate being reported in all of the countries together is just over 3%, but that is likely to be 
a significant overestimate because right now a lot of the people with milder illness um, aren't necessarily being tested and aren't necessarily being counted. Um, so that's a really important thing to know. Another is, um, and one of the things that's distinctly different about this virus from flu viruses, is that with flu viruses, the gr age group that's most, most affected by flu and where there's the most transmission are kids. Um, kids are the absolute transmitters of flu virus. Um, but these coronaviruses, and that includes MERS and SARS, are the direct opposite in that most of the illness uh, seems to be in adults. And so if you look at all of the data from China of their 80-some thousand cases, 8% um, uh, of all of the disease that's been identified in China has been in people between the age of 20 and 30 years old. 1% uh, has been in people between the ages of 10 and 19. And less than 1% has been in people under the age of 10. And so it has a uniquely different pattern in terms of demographics, and so most of you sitting in this room are gonna be at that lower end of the spectrum, and if you do get infected, you're likely to get very, very mild disease. So I've got to go I was oh, just gonna say, so you, we, we need more data in order to understand the official death rate, I guess. Yes, uh, that's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's a question for me, uh, which is, Paul, what is GLG's strategy for off our, our, our offices in a mayor? Many employees here in London are taking a reactive approach after they've found patient zero. Um, how do we prevent the spread in a building? Um, well, thanks for the question, Anna. Um, as I said earlier, one of the things I do uh, always is take advice. So, Dr. Ostroff, how do you think about employers and buildings and building closures and how you can kind of uh, try and get ahead of the problem or respond to the problem? How, what, what's your advice for, for folks? Well, I, I watch what's going on and I, you know, listen to advice from the public health authorities about what appropriate things to do are and what inappropriate things to do are. Um, but, uh, you know, for most businesses, they have preparedness plans in place. They have contingency plans in place, whether it's for something like this or whether if there's going to be a hurricane or some other disaster in, in terms of how you do your continuity of operations. And, um, you know, it's always good to have them in mind and to know when it's appropriate to pull them off the shelf and start using them. Okay, I think for, uh, and Anna, uh, just to kind of finish off the question, um, I tried to give a sense of that earlier, which is we are actively monitoring um, the situation, the data, the local situation, um, getting advice from, uh, from the, uh, the official authorities, from folks like uh, doc Dr. Ostroff. If at any point we decide to kind of take a different approach, we'll let you know for now, there is no reason to change our approach, no reason to close down offices in places where we haven't already done that. So we'll continue to operate in those uh, offices and absolutely monitor local information and local uh, data to help, uh, to help inform that decision. Um, uh, another question, uh, Dr. Ostroff. Uh, we've heard that COVID-19 affects elderly patients, um, uh, which, you've already, which you've just mentioned. How is, how is it expected to impact those with compromised immune systems? And Noel particularly calls out pregnant women and their unborn babies and infants, uh, for example. Yeah, so there have been some um, assessments of uh, women who were pregnant in China during um, the recent problems in China, and it this one, this one isn't a Zika situation where a lot of you heard with Zika that there were um, congenital problems associated with the uh, um, children born to mothers who were infected during pregnancy. This one doesn't look like any of that is going on. And that is consistent with what we see with all of the other coronaviruses. And so there isn't any reason to think that there would be any specific risk associated with pregnant women. Most of the Sort of the concerns have been about you know people that may have uh, underlying you know immune compromising conditions like um, cancer or like HIV, and then the others are especially people who have underlying respiratory problems because it just makes it easier for the virus to cause an infection in people whose lung architecture isn't normal. And so we worry about people who have bad underlying emphysema, uh, bad bronchitis, or um, several other um, you know, respiratory problems. And, and those are the groups that are most, we're most concerned about, okay. regardless of age. 
Um, we, we've got a, 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 a question perhaps at the opposite end of the spectrum from, from Min. Um, given the purportedly low mortality rate, which we've just discussed is not quite certain yet, and high percentage of mild symptoms, and I, I heard a data point that 80% of people who actually contract the disease have quite a mild experience. Uh, would you say that the global reaction is proportionate? So I wouldn't use the term mild. The way mild is being used for those 80% of people is that their illness wasn't severe enough to warrant hospitalization. Right. It's not the same thing <laughs> as saying mild. <laughs> and, and so, you know, keep that in mind. There are people that have had, you know, mild illness. Yeah. But, you know, the flu can be pretty bad. Yeah. Um, the one thing that we do know is that if, if there starts to be a lot of illness, um, at least in this country, I feel pretty certain that what they will do is they will say to you, you know, first get in touch with your, your, your health care provider um, and um, tell them what your situation is. But if you're not severely ill, they'll just tell you to stay home. And um, because they want to save those hospital beds and they want to save the emergency departments for those people who really need to access those services, and you don't want to overwhelm the health care system. And so it is very likely that they will just say to you, um, you know, let's not, number one, overwhelm the healthcare system, and number two, if you're not really ill, just sort of stay home and, and, and treat yourself symptomatically and, uh, you know, not put a lot of other people at risk of getting infected. Okay. Um, uh, but, but, so your other question about whether or not this is being overhyped, um, it's a new virus. We don't know what it's going to do, and so, um, I'm not sure that I would use overhyped, although I will say that this is one of the sort of the, uh, the newer examples of an emerging infection, and we don't have a lot of examples of some of these problems in an era where there's like boundless social media around this and, and unlimited numbers of way to, say, ways to put out lots of misinformation. And so my advice is, you know, use trusted sources. Um, and, you know, just follow what's going on. Information is power, and the more information that you have, I think the less threatening this will appear. Okay. So I've actually uh, been read, I've, we've got two questions that ask different versions of mutation um, of the virus, and one saying that there are reports that are already two strains identified with one being more aggressive, but in general, how do you think about potential mutations and whether that can shift the outcomes yeah. so, associated? So, Viruses like this, when they reproduce themselves, are very sloppy. Um, they, they make mistakes when they reproduce themselves. And so what you can see over time is you can see the accumulation of mutations in the virus. In fact, that's one of the ways that you track the virus. And it's also one of the ways that allowed scientists to determine that it was a brand new virus because initially they didn't see very many mutations in the virus. They all looked essentially identical to each other. Um, those mutations most of the time enhance the adaptability of the virus to humans because if the mutations go in the other directions and it becomes less transmissible, they kind of die out in favor of the other ones. Um, so that's generally the tendency. This virus will evolve over time and what you will eventually see is that the version that's in China, the version that's in Europe, the version that's in North America, will look slightly different from each other because they're circulating sort, sort of semi-independently for each, from each other. And in fact, you can use that information to tell where they originated from. But they won't, this is, this is not like the flu virus. Uh, the flu virus, as all of you know, um, changes quite a bit from year to year to year. That's why you have to get a new flu shot every year because the strains that that flu shot protects you against are different every single year. That's a unique characteristic of a flu virus. Coronaviruses don't have that characteristic. And so while the virus will certainly change over time, it's not going to change so much that the virus you see two years from now is going to be markedly different than the one that you see today. And that is sort of good news in terms of vaccines. Um, because it means that they won't constantly have to be updating the vaccine. When they do develop a vaccine against this, which I think, as all of you have heard, is going to take some time to do, it will likely be effective for many, many years. At some point, they may have to use a slightly different strain to make the vaccine, but that vaccine will work. And the other thing to know is that 
this virus, like many other viruses, it's likely that when you, if you do get infected, that that gives you immunity, which protects you from getting infected a second time. Okay, so um, here's what I'm gonna suggest. Uh, I, I think we actually only, only have five minutes before we switch to round two uh, between us. <laughs> so I'm gonna suggest we, we maybe kind of uh, cause a halt now. What, what I'm conscious of is there are some excellent questions here that I think we would all benefit from having answers to. Um, I, I'm gonna see if we can perhaps find some more time with you, Dr. Ostroff. Yep. I mean, we might do just a little video um, kind of update and kind of, you know, Joanna, perhaps if you could kind of follow up with, with I know you didn't get through all of your questions as well. well the other thing just to note is I'll be back on Monday, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that also works, that also works. Can we just give yeah. him a badge? To we, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. So, we, so um, we will find a way to get all of these, que the questions that we haven't answered, we will get them all answered um, uh, kind of uh, either today or on Monday uh, or, in, or, or, or to the point I made earlier, in the weeks coming, because we are going to keep on top of this. It is going to evolve. Uh, we are going to be transparent, um, and we'll kind of we'll, we'll get uh, we'll get as much information as we possibly can. Uh, with that, Dr. Ostroff, first of all, um, who kind of drove up from Pennsylvania last night at the kind of drop of a hat, like, we really appreciate the help you've given to our company and to our clients, um, and very specifically now for kind of making the journey so you could spend this time with us, us this morning. Joanna, thank you for uh, hosting the panel. Uh, let's give Dr. Ostroff a round of applause. Thank you.